People were outraged by Officer Derek Chauvin, now former Officer Derek Chauvin, with his knee on George Floyd's neck. The knee on the neck. And from coast to coast, everyone absolutely outraged, especially by that fact, the knee on the neck. Well, guess what, folks? Take a look at what you're looking at right here. That is from the police training manual. And then you've got George Floyd there. So where this all comes from is from a motion to dismiss. A motion to dismiss that was filed by Derek Chauvin's attorneys saying that the knee on the neck is part of his training as a Minneapolis police officer. And there we see it in the manual on the left and on the right is what we all have seen in the video of Officer Chauvin. So is this a game changer? How does this impact everything? Let's bring in our team with me right now. Joining me, Julie Janae, Court TV crime and justice reporter, Ashley Banfield, uh, special contributor, and Michael Ayala, Court TV anchor. Um, so this is all part now of a motion to dismiss by Derek Chauvin, the knee on the neck officer, who is claiming that the knee on the neck is part of his training. Julia Janae, explain to me what they filed here and, and what their argument is. This is a motion to dismiss. Derek Chauvin is arguing or attacking the probable cause in this case, saying that the state doesn't have enough evidence for this to even go forward, hoping that the judge will rule in his favor at the September 11th hearing that is upcoming, making these arguments. And it's similar to some of the arguments that we've seen from the other officers in this case, to Tao, Jay King, and uh, Thomas Lane, who have also filed their motion to dismiss. But this one, he is focusing on his conduct. These other officers have distanced themselves from his conduct, but he talks about his knee being on George Floyd's neck. And here's some takeaways from that document. He highlights that there was no bruising, no damage to the neck structure of George Floyd. And that's something that they are relying on based on the autopsy report. They're also saying that the 2018 training materials that show what the protocol is for the Minneapolis Police Department, that that authorizes a knee on the neck in certain situations, even saying that Chauvin was calm and professional throughout this situation, throughout this incident, and of course, making those arguments, trying to minimize the impact of his knee on George Floyd's neck. So in that motion to dismiss, a lot of different factors, a lot of different arguments being made by this officer in advance of that hearing that's upcoming. Yeah, but this one is absolutely shocking. I mean, I mean, this is what the whole story is about. This is what outraged millions and millions of people. This is what caused the protest. It was the knee on the neck. And now Ashley Banfield, the defense is saying, dismiss the charges because the knee on the neck is right there in the police training manual. Yeah, I think politically that's going to be really hard. Um, and I, I also think anybody who thought about dismissing these charges would also think about the city burning. Because I don't think that the public knows enough about all the arcanity of this case, and they need to know it. I think, it, like in any case, it's never how it automatically looks in the headline, and this is one of those cases. I think this is pretty strong stuff. What people will say, though, is when they see the snippet of video that has been played over and over in the news, they'll think, but how can any officer, any human being be so callous? The man was clearly pleading, I can't breathe. You know, please, please, please. You're right. He was. But a jury would see the entire 40-minute tape in which he was saying the same things 40 minutes prior while he was standing upright, and there was nobody putting any pressure on him at all. So the officers, once a jury and anybody else who cares to actually look at all of the tape, not just a you know a nine-minute or a 10-minute piece, once you see it all, you'll start to realize, okay, he's actually been saying those words over and over again before he was ever prone. So they had heard that before. And if that's what their argument is, is that we were doing exactly what we're supposed to do in training. And no, we weren't being callous because he had already been saying, I can't breathe, even when we weren't, you know, um, pinning him down. 
then they might have a pretty good argument to make, even in front of a jury that's inflamed by all, all of the coverage. And, and I got to say, inflamed is putting it mildly. Uh, I mean, I heard a presidential candidate the other night say this was a murder. I've heard governors call this a murder. And I learned many, many years ago, it isn't a murder until a jury says so. And that's inexcusable to actually indict people before they've had a fair defense. I think John Adams would be the first person to say that. Michael Ayala, you, you look at the training manual that they, they're going to be able to put in front of this jury and say, yeah, this is, this is part of the training. This is part of what you are supposed to do. Uh, how powerful is it? Vinny, you know, and you know this, if you've done enough of these cases, you look at the paperwork, and these cases begin to magically appear before your eyes. It's like Beethoven. He would start playing, and these symphonies would show up. When I read through this paper paperwork, because that's what we do here at Core TV, right? We go through the minutia. First of all, I was shocked to see that. But one of the main issues in this case legally for Chauvin was there came a point, OK, you can argue that he was actively resisting. And at that point, uh, according to their manual, you can use neck restraints. But there comes a point where everyone is telling him, look, he's not responding anymore, right? Even his own partner saying, should we turn him on his side? This is not good. And he doesn't. And I want our viewers to get familiar with the very important word here. It's called excited delirium. You hear Chauvin say it. He's worried about excited delirium. That's what he's going to use to explain why, when he was no longer responsive, he continued with the knee on the neck. Because that, when you talk about excited delirium, it's about people who use drugs, which they're going to claim they saw him using. That's why they're talking about the tablet on the tongue. Bizarre behavior. We saw that. But eventually, it gets to something that's called superhuman strength. Oftentimes, people in that position, they show superhuman strength. And this, Vinny, that picture shows how you're supposed to restrain people when you're afraid for excited delirium. Unbelievable. This is a game changer, Vinny. It's going to be tough to overcome this training instruction picture that shows exactly how he was doing it by the book, Vinny, by the book. It's problematic. It's problematic Ooh, yes, for prosecutors. Uh, Julie, today, let's talk about prosecutors. Um, did they address this in any of their court filings, the, the training manual and what it says to do and what it says to not do? And what's their take, their interpretation of all this? Absolutely. The state has been talking about the training manual and training protocol from the beginning. They didn't show that picture that we see in the defense filings, but they have said all along that this was not according to protocol and that it was dangerous. Take a look at what they actually put in one of their responses to another motion to dismiss. They said that officers are also trained to employ a neck restraint and that is defined by compressing both sides of the neck either with a person's arm or leg but that they can only do that when the person is passively is not passively resisting. When they are passively resisting, that is not a situation, according to the training manual, where that kind of restraint can be used. When they are, um, when it is a higher level of resisting, where the person is actually trying to take over control of the officer, they are actively resisting, that is the only time that they are able to use that maximum restraint. So restraint and resistance are going to be the two key words that these parties are going to have to bring in they're supporting evidence to show what George Floyd's level of resistance was and what these officers' level of restraint was during this incident. Yeah, and, and Ashley, I, I understand exactly what the, the state is saying here. The problem is they've a, accused him of murder, right? Not reckless disregard. Intentional, not, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, okay, the purpose of all of these actions were to assault him and he died, and it's and it's Minnesota's version of felony murder. Um, mm. That it, to me, that just becomes more difficult with the training manual, especially because it has a picture. Yeah, and I listen. I say this over and over again, and I always think it's worth repeating, and it's worth sounding like a broken record in this day and age. This is not to minimize what Black Americans go through on a regular basis. It is hard to be Black in America. They find it very, very difficult to even be stopped for speeding. I mean, I don't have to explain this. This is reality for black Americans. Just look on the street. There's a reason people are upset. But the cases have to be looked at individually. And not every case is going to fit 
the narrative that's out on the street. And I think this is one of those cases where if you look at the very, very clear pieces of evidence moment by moment, the state attorney was right. At the very beginning, he said, don't hang your hat on this case. I think he was trying to warn the public, look, you may be grabbing the wrong case to make your point. There are lots of cases, hundreds of thousands of cases over the years where black Americans have been unfairly targeted. People I work with at CNN were unfairly targeted on the sidewalk outside of CNN because they were coming to work at four o'clock in the morning. They were asked to show their ID. I never was. I'm white. They were. They were black. That's a problem. That's got to be stopped. People are getting shot. People are getting hurt. They're black. And that does happen. But to pick the wrong case and make a point of it might alienate the supporters out there who I think everyone needs in this particular social movement. I hope I'm not on too much of a soapbox, but I don't want people watching this segment and thinking court TV is racist. We look at the facts and on this case, it is tricky. Absolutely. And Michael, let me, let me pick up on something that you mentioned before that at some point he's, he's not resisting anymore. I mean, it's, it's obvious he's, he's out. Um, is this, something less than murder, perhaps? I mean, I mean, does that picture doesn't take us out of the criminal world, does it? Ooh, Vinny, you know, I don't want to speculate, but I can tell you that first video that we played at the beginning of the segment, you actually hear Chauvin say, because um, they're telling him he's not responsive. He's not responsive. And he says, I'm worried about excited delirium. Right? So it's that's actually Lane, down. though. That's I'm not sorry. Chauvin. I think that's Lane. Oh, I think that's, that's Lane, Lane, Michael. That's the okay, rookie. Lane. What, that's what the else? rookie. That's the rookie saying it. And I think there were conversations going back and forth. But the prospect of excited delirium is there. If a rookie knows it, Chauvin knows it. And again, he's performing exactly to the book. That's what's most devastating about it. He's performing to the book. So the question is going to become, how much leeway is the jury going to give him to make that argument? Are they going to look at this and say, at some point, you've got to see that this has now become a dangerous situation and you're continuing? There really is no need. Excited delirium is out of the window. Stop it. Stop saying it. it's not going to work. Or are they going to give him the benefit of the doubt here? And that's where, it, you know, all it, all it is, Vinny, is a reasonable doubt. It's, it's not that difficult. And this certainly sullies the waters. Yeah, that, that is a problem. We've been saying it from the beginning. I mean, every case is difficult to prosecute because you have that, that burden. Yes. And, and we need that burden because of wrongful convictions, like a case Ashley will be talking about uh, in, in next hour. Uh, so we need that burden. But um, we're going to continue to cover the story, folks. And when new information comes out, you'll hear it right here on Court TV with this team of incredible legal journalists.